Good morning, church. What a joy to be here this morning with you on this wonderful Father's Day celebration. You know, I was very excited about things that have already taken place. You are a very busy church. Are you okay? Should I help you? You okay? It's good. Okay. All right. So uh, it's a privilege and a pleasure, delight for Barbara and myself to be here. You know, it's amazing when you travel around the world, people that you meet. And uh, Pastor Grace, you know, when she came to my class, uh, that was, I think it was a year ago, she has this smile. Uh, you don't know that maybe, but, uh, you know, those of us who meet her only occasionally, because you're used to it, uh, she has this kind of a smile. And when she asks, you cannot say no. <laughs> you know, and that was a problem. Because, you know, uh, we as preachers, we always say, yeah, maybe next time. But her, you know, understanding next time was this year. <laughs> so, you know, when she wrote us, I had no choice. I had to actually say yes, you know. So we were supposed to actually go to Indonesia or go back home earlier. And, you know, so we said, okay, we're going to stay for the weekend. And we're going to come to the church and we are going to minister here. And so here we are, you know, glad to be here. We were blessed already by Pastor Kang, you know, and uh, uh, Pastor Grace. You know, they took us uh, out so we can get uh, a little bit acquainted before the service here. And we had a wonderful time of fellowship, getting to know the heart of your pastors, you know, and also the ministry God has uh, put on their heart, and we are thinking, you know, that uh, this is just the beginnings of good things. Well, thank you for two people who are awake and said amen. God bless you for that. You know, uh, I always have a problem with the churches, you know, because any time you come to church, there is a powerful worship service. And when the preacher comes out to preach, then everybody just kind of pulls back, you know. So please don't do that to me. In, in my service, it's not, you know, a sin to say amen. So you can say amen, you can shout, you can stand up and shout, you can do whatever you want. It's okay with me. We're used to it. Because we travel all over the world, and you know, when you're in certain countries, before you say anything, they say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And I say, wait until I say something. <laughs> you know, <laughs> in other churches you go to, you know, and preach, and you say something, and about five minutes later, mm -hmm, you know, they process the information, and then they say amen. So, yeah, I had uh, both of them, Pastor Grace, and uh, I had James with me in the class. Good job, you know, good man. So you have good people in the church. Amen? Yeah. Yes, you are blessed. So praise the Lord. On this Father's Day, you know, seeing the children performing here, I was just kind of reminded of our grandchildren. We have 11 grandchildren. Yes, yes. The oldest one's 23 and the youngest is four. And so our youngest son is married, but no children yet. So I told him, you know what, uh, there's going to be at least one more because 12 is a good number. 12, you know, uh, uh, tribes. You know, there is 12 disciples. You know, 12 people play on the football field, and I want to have 12 in my home. All right? So we made a deal. So it's going to be 12 definitely, you know, if not more. So, and we are so blessed, you know, by our grandchildren. We have five children, all of them already grown up, as I say, married. You no, know, they are already, you know, in their, on their way to do what God has called him in life. When it comes to the Father's Day service, actually I prepared a Father's Day sermon. And I thought I'm going to preach that until about recently when I found out, you know, that you have a series on the Holy Spirit. And then I thought, you know what, if I preach for the fathers only, you know, you're speaking to about, what was that, 60? 70 people here, but if I preach on the Holy Spirit, which is the theme that you are dealing with, then I can at least talk to every one of you. Amen? So, but to the fathers, no, I read this little, little short story of two little boys. When they were here in the front, I was thinking about that. Just remember, I said, I, I, I'm going to share this with you, all right? Two little boys sit in the kindergarten, about five years of age, they're sitting together, and this one, you know, like he's a little bit more kind of a, and, a yada, and he says to a, his little friend, he says, My father can beat up your father. And the little guy said, So can my mom. <laughs> 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 
Well, that was no deal, man, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so can my mom, you know, so, you know, one was proud of his dad and the other one has a different image of his dad. I hope that your grandchildren have a better image than this of yourself, amen, or your children. So, but you know, kids are very genuine. I always said to my Sunday school teachers, you know what, not everything that kids share with you, you can share, it's confidential. Because when you're in a Sunday school, you know, you teach the little children and there's some, some kind of a topic comes up. They say, oh yeah, you know, in our house, and then begin to tell the story about it. So I said to the Sunday school teacher, you are confined to confidence. Because you know, you find out about the parents that no one else knows in the church when you teach Sunday school. Because kids don't know that they're open or they share whatever they know, right? So, you know, to be a Sunday school teacher, you've got to be very careful, you know, because information you receive may not necessarily be a good thing to share with anyone else. But this morning, you know, I'm going to share a different type of information with you. And I'm going to be talking about one thing that I believe that all over the world where we go, very few churches have ever managed to preach on this topic. And that is the fire of the Holy Spirit. You know, being a Pentecostal, four square, you know, being charismatic, whatever not, we always talk because, you know, like a lot of people say, you know, when you talk about Pentecostals, what do you mean? When I talk about Pentecostals, I mean all those who have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you know, who have been empowered. You know, these are the Pentecostal charismatics are those who have spiritual gifts. Irregardless as to what church you go to, you know, if you are manifesting, you're working, you know, if you are functioning in the spiritual gifts, you are charismatic. If you belong to charismatic church or not, it doesn't make any difference. You know, so, but now, when you have Pentecostals, you know, like, we talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we talk about speaking in tongues, but you know, one thing we don't talk about, and it's probably as essential as the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is the fire of the Holy Spirit. When I saw, you know, uh, some of your pastors and leaders going to solo, you know, I know where they are going. I've been around there many, many times over the last 20 plus years. You know, I've been in Indonesia probably 60, 70 times, sometimes four times a year, sometimes three times a year. And we've been across Indonesia from Sumatra all the way to Manado. You know, we have crossed all the islands now over where, you know, I spoke in various conferences. I've been to Indonesia for revival meetings. We had crusade services in several Several big cities, you know, we had everything. I know a little bit about Indonesia, and I would like to encourage you as a church, pray for them. Pray for them. Indonesia has a harvest that they haven't had from 1929. They had a revival going there. And since then, you know, there was nothing happening between much, you know. So in the last few years, Indonesia is becoming probably one of the most fastest growing uh, uh, number-wise, you know, Christians in all of Asia. There is churches with 50,000, 40,000 people, 60,000 people, 25,000 people, churches. It's amazing, you know, what's happening there. I've ministered to several of those churches, you know. You go there, one of the churches in Surabaya, 25,000 seating capacity. On Thursday night, in that church, there were 9,000 people gathered for prayer. Sunday morning service, 20,000 people in the first service. You know, they had another facility just around the corner, the same church in the city, 4,000 people simultaneously praying, where there was 9,000 people praying there were 4,000 people praying in another building on the other side of the city you know so you can see you know you're talking of numbers that are incredible and when you see all that you realize one thing God has shown grace to this church one more time Revival is taking place in many, many churches around the world. People are coming to Jesus not by one, two. People are coming to Jesus by thousands and thousands. Yes. Amen. So what is the reason for that? Catch the fire. 
Our good friend, Reinhard Bonke, he has written a book about the fire. All right? Him and I, we talk several times now because uh, he lives very close to our daughter in Florida in the United States. And so every time we go there, we visit him and then we talk and compare the notes and see what is happening. And so I share my evangelistic and my experiences and he tells me about his crusade services and his experience and then we compare notes. And I realize one thing. Behind all the things that Ryan and Bonke talks, it's all about. He says to me, you need to continue to be full of the fire of the Holy Ghost. You need the fire of the Holy Ghost. You need the fire of the Holy Ghost. Man, that man is full of fire of the Holy Ghost. That's why we have 1.5 million people at his crusade service. People don't, don't come to a crusade service just because someone speaks there. People come there because they know that the someone who is speaking there is a man who is set on fire of God. And so this morning I'd just like to read two scriptures. John chapter 5 verse 35. The gospel of John 5 35. And I'm going to share another scripture of Matthew 3 11. Two scriptures concerning the same subject. John chapter 5, 35. The last part of the verse talking about John the Baptist, it says, he was a burning and shining light. Matthew 3, 11, it says, he will baptize you with Holy Spirit and with fire. You know, when you think about it, there was a darkness in the, in, in, among the people of Israel. 400 years, there was no prophetic light. For 400 years. And there was stillness without a prophetic voice. People of Israel were very used to having the voice of God and they having the exhibiting of dreams and visions and the you know, prophetic voices that would come into them. Now for 400 years, there is stillness. There is no talk of God. There is no show off of God. There was nothing you know. So it was real wilderness. How? Geographically, morally, politically, but also spiritually. It was wilderness among the people of God. And suddenly the Bible says, God raised John the Baptist. And he came. And the Bible says, you know, that he was saying, the one who is coming after me, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You know, for you here in the city, you have no idea what fires are unless you live in the places where there is fires. Our son lives in Los Angeles, and you know, every year there are fires outside the city, sometimes very close to the city. I think it was a year ago, too. You know, the fire came so close that our son was looking out of his living room window, and he can see the fire burning. So close, they, had, they were all ready to prepare to evacuate. The fire was so close, you know, to, uh, just a few blocks away, maybe five, six blocks away from the house, there was a fire burning. And when you see that fire, it is an amazing energy that is just, you know, rushing forward and is just taking everything in its path. Fire. We are talking about raging fire we're talking about wildfire we are talking about blazing fire we are talking about infernos we are talking about all kinds of flames and out of control fires you know fire is an amazing thing because anytime the fire burns there's something happening and people are there to see it people are there to see it and so the Bible talks about here, you know, that when God baptized them with the Holy Spirit's power, if that power is not propelled by the very passion of the fire of the Holy Spirit, it goes nowhere. You know, if you're going to build something up and you're going to have power, but that power is contained in one particular, whatever that may be. If you don't release that, it's going to explode. But so, you know, Jesus said, hey, listen, you are going to receive the power. And that power needs to move on, move out. 
You know, you're going to be my witnesses. And we were talking, uh, you know, in the last two weeks, evangelism class where uh, Pastor Grace and uh, James were participating. You know, evangelism. How do you get the church to get out you know, of their own four walls? You can educate them to death and they will not do it. You can tell them, you can promise them, you can do whatever you want to do. You're going to realize now that in most churches, only 60% of people are excited about evangelism. And only 12% of people in church do evangelism. Any church that wants to have a growth needs to have evangelistic effort and we were singing some you know uh, choruses here you know talking about these things and i can tell you one thing it's a very nice thing though know, when we talk about those things but you see if you are here in a church i don't know for how long but for at least some time you should be already reproducing because you see there is a very simple saying anything that lives gives you cannot contain the life of God in you without sharing and giving it and the Bible says when you give you'll receive when you give you'll receive it is the principle of God for every one of us you know sometimes when we think about the passion and the fire of the Holy Spirit that is supposed to kind of work itself out becomes a catalyst you know for evangelism it goes on you know and just propels people on and sometimes you know, we think how is the world around us going to change not by people who are not empowered and not full of the Holy Spirit's fire you know, God doesn't need 1,000 people to start some work in the city. God doesn't need that. God just brings people in who have been exposed to the fire of God and releases them and they do just a ministry for him. Think of Moses. I mean, Moses was in Egypt. He was a big man, you know. He was a prince, you know. He's supposed to be the next pharaoh. He has all at his disposal. And one day, you know, by this one thing that he has done, you know, he's driven into the wilderness, stays there, and God empties Moses of Moses. By the time God shows up, 40 years later, Moses doesn't know who he is. Because God says, no, I wanted to send you, you know, to, back to Egypt. And he says, who am I? It's a good start, no? If you want to do something for God, you need to get to the position where God empties you from your selfishness, from yourself, from anything that is in you, and releases you with what he has imparted. Come and see the fire first. And when he was touched by the fire of that burning bush, he was ready to go back to Egypt and start, you know. And it took only one man to lead two million people out of Egypt into the promised land. One man. You don't need an army. You don't need 20 people. Sometimes, you know, when we are going someplace, we say, oh, you know, we need a lot of people to help us out. You know what? That's true in some cases, and it's not a problem. But most cases, God does not depend on the crowds. He doesn't depend on the thousands. He just wants to have you, one you, full of the Holy Spirit and full of the fire, and you can change the world around you. Amen. Yeah. You can. And there is Elijah fighting 400 bills, prophets plus 408 and other ones. You know, one man, one man. The whole kingdom is almost at stake with this one man. And what does the Bible say? You know, he says, uh, I know someone who is fire. And let's see whose God is the real God. You set up an altar, I'm going to set up an altar, and let's see. One man fighting Bale's prophet and winning and changing the landscape of that world. At that time, at least, you know, so for Elijah. Jesus, one man. Paul, one man to the Gentiles. Peter, one man to the Jews. So God does not need many, but what he needs is those who commit themselves to him with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, with the power of God in them, and then the fire burning of passion for the souls. Please don't go to evangelize and don't do things for God if there is no passion in your life. 
We are not religious people that are selling religion like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and who knows what. We are not that kind of people. We have passion for souls. And when a passion burns in your heart and you're seeing someone who is not safe, no, there's got to be that burden and that passion in your life that you are going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Because without it, it's just a religion. It doesn't do anything to anyone. And so many times I see, you know, that even in our churches where we were pastor, we've trained people. You know, we had all kinds of things from evangelism explosion to whatnot, you know. And we had 16-week courses. And we got all these people. And then one day, just before they went out, for the first time, I came into that, uh, you know, teaching session. And I look at uh, the teacher who was there. And I said to him, so how are things going? He says, very well. They know the program. They have gotten ready. You know, they are ready to go out. I said, no, they are not ready. He said, what do you mean? I said, I don't see fire in their hearts. They're not ready. They need to have a passion. And so, you know, why do we need the fire? Because God is a God of fire. This is one of the attributes of God is the fire. I'm just going to read a few scriptures, one after another, just to show you this, how it works, okay? So, Genesis 15, 17. You remember when Abraham was making a covenant with God? He has brought the nano, cut it in half, put the halves, you know, on each side of the altar. And the Bible says then in Genesis 15, 17, when the sun has set and the darkness has fallen, a smoke fiery pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between those pieces. God showed up with fire as God was making covenant with uh, Abraham. Then we read Exodus chapter 3 verse 2. There's an angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that bush and it was on fire and it did not burn up. Exodus 13. It says, by the day, you know, the Lord went ahead in a pillar of a cloud to guide them on the way by night, a pillar of fire follow them, you know, so that they would know where they are going. Exodus 13, you know, uh, tells us this. And then we have 19. The Lord descended upon Mount Sinai in fire. Uh, Leviticus 9 tells us there came a fire out from the Lord. David, as he was called on the Lord, the Bible says in First Chronicle 21, David called upon the Lord and he answered him from heaven by fire. Solomon is dedicating the temple. You know the story in chapter 7. And then the Bible says like this. When Solomon made uh, an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven. From heaven. And then you can read on and on and on. But there's one verse in the Old Testament that is kind of very, very uh, uh, dear to my heart. Because God is talking to Moses. And in the, uh, there he says in Leviticus 6 verse 13. It says, a perpetual fire shall burn on the altar and shall never go out. A perpetual fire. God wanted to make sure, you know, that his presence, the, the representation of his attribute, his character, is going to be always among the people of God. And so they set up an altar, and God says, on this altar, the fire shall never go out. And I can tell you one thing, you know, when we do ministry, it doesn't matter who does it, it doesn't matter what kind of ministry it is, on the altar, there's got to be a fire burning in the hearts of those who minister, being the worship team, being the, you know, uh, players of the music, you know, being the preacher, teacher, you know, praying, whatever is done. This platform should have a fire burning Sunday after Sunday, week after week, month after month, year after year. The fire shall never go out. Never. It's got to be there. Because other than that, you know, our service to God is not worth a whole lot. To Jeremiah, it's interesting, you know, Jeremiah was one of those prophets. He was young. He didn't want to do the ministry because God always gave him something to preach or to, uh, to, to, to tell and to proclaim that was not so good. 
You know, when I was a young preacher, I tell you, you know, in some, some of uh, my ministry sermons, they were not very good. You know, they were like really hard messages. I know your pastor is always kind. I don't know if he ever preached a message like that. But you know, when I was a pastor, you know, God gave me some of those messages. And I tell you, I didn't want to preach that. I prepared my sermon, and then I prepared the second one. Just in case, you know, maybe God changes his mind. I can preach the other one. This is a nice one. This one is not so good. And here is the prophet Jeremiah. My a similar situation and he's there you know and he has something to say and now he realizes man I don't want to do that and it says in chapter 9, uh, 20 verse 9 and I said I will not make mention of him nor speak anymore in his name but his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary of forbearing and I you know could not Stay like that. You know, when you have a message, I can tell you, there is nothing more powerful than be on fire for God. It's burning in your heart. You know, sometimes, you know, when I get a message from the Lord, you know, I can't wait to get to the pulpit and to preach the message because it's burning like a fire in my soul. And so Jeremiah got this. Here. Man, I tell you, you know, he was... But then, you know, God told him in uh, chapter 5, verse 14... I will make my words in your mouth a fire. You go evangelize and you go and meet people. You know, you're going to see that the words that you are speaking, they're going to be like fire. They're going to be burning in the souls of people. Changing the surrounding. Anything the fire touches cannot remain the same. Got to be changed. And so, you know, when we come to that kind of understanding, we realize how God wants to use us. You know, fire is not something that is an option. It is a command. It is a command. Abraham, the Bible tells us, had a fire of sacrifice. You imagine, here is Abraham, finally he has the son of promise. He's excited, man, you know, finally I got, oh, Isaac, you know, Isaac. Now God comes to him and he says, Abraham, your son, Isaac, the one you love most. You know, I mean, God is just playing up, you know, in his emotion. And he's just trying to tell him, you know, how he loves this uh, son, you know. And now he's excited about him and all these things. And then he says, I want you to offer him on the altar to me. Now, if all nations should come through him, and he knows you know, the promises of God, and now God comes and cuts right into his life, and he says, offer up your son. I don't know how many of us would do that. Probably none of us. Because you have a promise in the back of your mind, and God says, you know, I am going to bless you, and you're going to have, you know, kind of a birth nations, not just one, but nations, you know. And here's the son, here's the heir, here's the one who is a channel, you know, the nations will come forth from him. And now God says, offer him. And as they go, you know the story. Three days almost later, they come to the mountain. And Isaac is kind of wondering because he has been more than one time seeing his dad bringing the offering. And he knows there's three things that you need in order to make an offering, right? There's wood, there's fire, and there's land. When you have those three things, you can do an offering. But without those three things, neither one, if it's missing, you know, does not make you, you know, able to make an offering. And so now Isaac asks his dad, he says, okay, I can see, you know, we have wood and we have a fire, but where is the land? So what do you say if you're a father like that? Oh, you know what? <laughs> you know, you are the one. I, I don't think, you know, that would be a good thing. So what did Abraham actually says? He says, the Lord will provide. So Abraham is ready to do what God asked him to do. You see, today, 4,000 plus years, we have reversed that. And we can say today, Lord, 
We have wood, the cross. We have the lamb, Jesus Christ. But where is the fire? Where is the fire? The wood is good, you know, and the lamb is good. But we need a fire in order to have a completion of an offering, you know, that is going to produce results for the kingdom of God continuously. Abraham is willing to do that. Moses, same thing. You know about Esther, right? Everybody knows Esther. Yeah. She came into palace to become a queen. You know what? In our day, in our hyper grace, in our charismatic, in our whatever kind of a thinking, of, we would say, thank you, Lord Jesus. You brought me here to this place. I'm so glad that I'm here because you see, you wanted to save my life. My people are going to perish, but you provided for me. I am so blessed. You, know, you see, God is so good to me because he's saving me from all that. You know, and my people are going to die. But I, favor of God, I, I'm going to be okay. If you have a fire of the Holy Spirit in your life, first thing you realize, people who are on fire never think about themselves. Oh, there's no amen here. I, that was a good time to say amen. <laughs> people who are on fire never think about themselves. She's thinking about her people. She's thinking about annihilation. She's thinking, God placed me here for one reason. And that is that I will save my people. And that's why my job is. This is what God assigned to me. And so I'm going to do what I need to do. And now she realizes, if I go to the king and enter his room, you know, without being invited, that means certain death. But when you're in a fire, you don't count your life to be worth anything compared to what God wants to do for the rest. And so she comes and she says, if I perish, I perish. You know, this is a person on fire. These are the people that understand, the, you know, what God is doing in our life. And sometimes, though, know, we want to be so comfortable. We want to be protected. We want to be safe. We want to be, you know, everything that is contrary to anything what the scripture tells us. If I perish, I perish. There's Daniel's friends. And the Bible tells us. The king had edict out. Everybody has to bow to the image. If not, they're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. You know, in Canada, because we have the cold winters, we have fireplaces. And you know, sometimes then, you know, we put the fire on and, uh, you know, you, you realize when the fire burns for about an hour or so, the whole fireplace gets hot. Even the bricks outside is very warm. So once the fire is out, you can leave the fire out and it kind of heats the house even throughout the night, you know. There is heat coming from those bricks, you know, because they've been heated by fire. And sometimes when I want to put some kind of wood in there, I realize, no, you cannot even get close to it because if you're about in a distance like this, you know, you feel, you no, know, your, your hand start burning, the, the hair just burns off right to your hand. That's how strong it is. And this is just a film of fire. When you think of Daniel, you know, and the friends they were facing, you know, that kind of a fire, this fire was not a small little fireplace in the middle of the living room. I mean, this was a huge thing. And now there is a challenge. If you don't bow, if you don't worship, that's where you're going to be. It's one thing to sit nice in a comfortable church today and think about it and say, well, you know, I mean, you know, if that's God's will, man, oh, no, 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 no. When you are fire, uh, seeing fire like this and you feel the heat from afar, you know exactly what that means. And what do they do? They say, you know what? We have two uh, the different uh, you know, decisions to make. One is, we can just quickly bow down, please the king, and then we can stay in the kingdom for the rest of our life and help, you know, and do this. So, and so we can be very, very, you know, essential for our people. Or we can die 
and no one benefits from our position in the government anymore. This is it. Still now, we were influencing things you know, in the right way. But if we are gone, no one's going to be there who's going to influence. Maybe you know, a little compromise would be okay. I mean, just quickly bow down and just acknowledge and say, okay, okay, God, now forgive me, and the life goes on. Ah, uh, no, no. When you are, you know, know, in the knowledge of who God is, and you know, you know, the fire of God in your heart, you are not going to give up. You're not going to do it. It doesn't matter what. Because this is a fire of fearlessness. Fearlessness. First, delivered to the flames. They were delivered to the flames. Then they were delivered into the flames. And then they were delivered out of the flames. But you see, there was one thing there. There's one time the fire in Los Angeles was burning so hot, you know, and I was listening to the news, and the fire department, um, the man, whatever he is, you know, he, over the whole county of Los Angeles, he said like this, when the fire is starting to get out of control, then what we do, we fight fire with fire. Fire with fire. And that's exactly what happened here in the book of Daniel. You see, these guys, you know, they had one thing. They knew we have a fire in our soul. We want to serve our God. And God, God is able to save us. But even if he does not, we will not bow to your image, O King. We will not bow to your image. And that fire that burned in their soul became stronger fire than the fire in the furnace. So God's fire was you know, feeding, defeating the fire in the furnace. No. And suddenly the king is there, totally amazed. His servants burned as they were feeding the fire. And he had those three guys no, thrown into the fire furnace. And they walk around as if they would just enjoy wonderfully a time. And suddenly he sees oh, there's a fourth one there. I thought we had only thrown three in there. Where is the fourth one coming from? Like unto the Son of God. You see, when you have a fire in your soul, it doesn't matter what enemy you face, your fire is stronger than anything that the other fire is going to do to your life. Anything. And so the Bible tells us these disciples realize if we are going to move out, Facing the persecution, facing problems, facing challenges. You see, Jesus was not, you know, one of those people saying, Oh, you, you, you want to do my ministry? No, you want to build my church? Okay. Well, I have an office in Jerusalem, and then we have several buildings there, you know, and I take care of it. No, you're going to be paid well. You know, you have all that. We're going to provide a worship team for you, and we're going to have a Sunday school teacher, so we're going to have all the stuff, whatever you need to know. It's all there. Would you like to come and serve me? What did he leave them with? A promise. A promise. Go to Jerusalem. Wait until you receive the power. And then you shall be my witnesses. There was no insurance. You know, there was no salary. There was no offices. There was no worship team. There was no nothing. You know, the only thing they have is the promise of Christ that he has given us. That he's going to give them power of the Holy Spirit. That's it. You know how many people today go into the places where there is no witness of Jesus Christ, there is no witness of God, and they go into those places, and you know, they start the church, and the church is just mushrooming and growing, and growing, and growing. Why? Because they have fire. Fire. In their hearts. There was a little church in Poland. After the revolution, you know, when Poland was no longer communist, so I went there to minister. And the pastor in one of the cities told me, you know, we have a little village church outside uh, the city here. And, you know, that church was up in the same number for a long, long time. And he said, one day the pastor got very frustrated. He said, this is it. If God's not going to turn around and we're not going to start growing and see people getting saved and healed and delivered and things will happen, I am out of here. So he kind of more or less, you know, negotiated with God an option. Either you do something about it or I'm getting out of here. 
totally frustrated. He says, this cannot be the church. The church of Jesus Christ cannot be stagnant. They cannot be in the same number. They cannot be coming and going. You know, every service is the same. Same people come, same people go. You know, there's not much change there. And he says, I cannot have that kind of a church. You know, I need to pass the church where there is power, where there is glory of God, where there is a presence of God, where there is something happening miraculously in a church. He says, I cannot be in a church like this. And so he told the church, we're going to have an every night prayer meeting. No program, just prayer meeting. All the way through, first week, second week, they're praying. You know, at first, few people more come, then less people came. Second week, few more people came back, you know. And so it was kind of going back and forth. Several weeks into praying, every single night, every single night, they gather together for prayer, 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 prayer. And suddenly, you know, one night as they were praying, and they, you know, Polish people are not very loud, but loud enough, you know, that when all pray, it's pretty noisy there. And so they hear a knock on the window. And so they think, no one noticed because there was a, a prayer, and the knock was louder and louder and louder. And suddenly the pastor walking by the window, look into the window, and there's a fireman. And he looks up and he says, Pastor, your church is on fire. And he says, Praise the Lord. We pray for that. Praise God. You know, wonderful. Our church is on fire. Let's worship the Lord and praise the Lord. And the fireman says, Pastor, you, you don't get it. Pastor, you don't get it. Your church building is on fire. <laughs> so they got out of the church. And look, you know, and the, the, the church, you know, was built like the, one of those little Lutheran, Catholic, whatever churches, you know, with a little tower and sit on it, you know. And so they're looking up and they see, you know, the thing is inflamed by fire. And the fire, and then they're trying to put out the flame, you know, and they're putting, putting, putting the water on it. And the more they put the water on, the more they realize that thing does not go down, you know. It still keeps burning, and it's stronger than before, and it's stronger than before. And they say, what in the world is going on? So they turn off the water, and everybody was just looking and looking and looking. And then Pastor came, he says, you have no idea what this is. This is not a fire, a physical fire. This is God's fire burning a church. God will do something miraculous in our lives. That night he preached with the exception of one family. Everybody in the village got saved in one night. We need a fire. We need a fire. Tell you one more story and close. Sitting in the office one day, the secretary came in and she says, Pastor, there's someone to see you. All right. I told the story, I think, in the, in, the, in the class. I said, okay, who is it? She says, I know. He just says, no, I want to see the priest. I want to see the priest. So I figured out, oh, must be a Catholic, all right? You know, so, and he came in. And I opens the door and stands in the front of me. I say, oh, I know what I'm seeing. And he says, what do you see? I say, I'm seeing someone who just got saved. He says, how, how, how do you see that? I say, it's written all over your face. Really? He says, you have no idea what happened. I said, no, I don't have an idea. I just know one thing. You got saved, right? Yes. I said, now tell me what happened. So he told me to make a long story short, you know, like him and his wife both were teachers in one particular school. And, you know, he was one of those guys that, you know, lived in a house with a wife, but never was the husband of the wife. You know what I mean? They just live in a house together. And she was complaining to him. She says, you know, what? Well, his name was Luciano. He says, you know, like, I really, I really, you know, don't like our marriage because we are not a marriage. We are just two people living in the same house. I want to have a husband. I want to have a husband. I want to have a husband. And you don't show any kind of an indication that you are my husband. We are just like two people in the same house. And so, one day, he came home, the house was empty. She got all the furniture, everything that belonged to her, and she moved out. And now Luciano faces a very grim situation. 
If you're an Italian and your wife leaves you, that means you know you are zero worth man. Zero. All right? Italian, they are macho people. You know, no one does this to them, this kind of thing, you know. And so he says to me, you know what? You know, he says, when I realized this, I was trying to win her back. I try, you know, all kinds of little things, you know, and so nothing. It's a very fact uh, that she disappeared, changed the phone number. He didn't even know how to get. She quit the job in a school where they were teaching, you know, and he had no connection to her anymore. And so he decided, before I'm going to tell my parents and my siblings, you know, that my wife just walked out on me, you know, and I am done, you know, she says, I'm just going to take my life. And so, you know, he's walking in the city and was going towards, we have a river going through the city, and he was walking towards a bridge, you know. He says, I'm going to jump off that bridge and I'm going to commit suicide. And as he's walking down the sidewalk, this man comes towards him and says, young man, young man, stop. You, you're, you're in trouble. You're in real trouble. And God wants to save your soul. And he said, what are you talking about? You know, like, yeah, you know. So, no, no, no. He says, no, really. I prayed this morning and God showed me, go down the street, you know, and there's going to be a young man and he's in trouble. He wants to commit suicide. And, you know, God wants to save his life because he has a purpose in his life. Struck him like a lightning. Now down on the sidewalk, he prayed for him. He accepted Jesus. And now, you know, with the joy that he had, he didn't know what to do with that. You know, now he's so excited, forgot about his wife and about all the things. So, and now he's just, you know, running around. I got in the car, start driving. I want to go to a church and I want to tell, you know, the priest that I got saved. And so he drove by our church, saw the cross on the church outside, turned him, and he came and he wanted to share. And I said to him, Luciano, it's wonderful. God has really been graceful to you. You know, he saved your soul. This is so wonderful. And now, you know, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, then the joy is going to be even greater. He said, what is this? I said, no, this is like a baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want it. I said, okay, wonderful. He says, I want it now. I said, not now. I have an appointment to go to, you know. Can't just do it now, you know. He says, Please, please, then I just want to have now, now. I said, Luciano, not now. I said, Luciano, tomorrow night we have a Bible study. You come to Bible study, we're going to pray, and you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know what he did? He came earlier. I was still preparing. Okay, priest, yes, let's go and, you know, receive the Holy Spirit. I said, not right now. I'm just preparing for the Bible study. We're going to do it after. No, 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 no. He says, no, let's go. Let's, let's do it now. Let's do it now. So, you know, I had no choice. Okay, let's go to the sanctuary. And he came and we were like in the front of the sanctuary. We pray, 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 you know, and people would come and pay, come, you know, and there's more people. And I said, come on, help us to pray. He wants to have a baptism in the Holy Spirit. And finally, you know, like just about a few minutes before the Bible study, started he started speaking in tongues and worshiping the Lord and it was all over the place so he was so excited you know and so I said okay Luciano we have to start now so please come and sit down and wait now until after the service we can continue he was sitting down on his seat you now while I was doing the Bible study I was going hallelujah and speaking in tongues and I was so excited speaking in tongues you now and I thought okay okay you know Luciano just get going it's, a, it's fine with me so the Bible study is over you know people are going by saying goodbye and he was speaking in tongues saying goodbye to them he could not even say anything else you know so next morning he wakes up speaks in tongues you know and is worshiping the lord and he's a french teacher he teaches french language in canada you know and so he comes into the class and starts speaking in tongues to the students and they are looking at him and say what is he what what kind of a French is this now? We, we never heard those words before. And he was speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues. You know, and the kids are looking at him saying, uh, Teacher, uh, we don't understand what you're talking. Oh, he says, you, you want to know what I'm talking about? So he started to preach to the children and preach to the children. You know, and they say, you can receive that too. You can receive Jesus in your heart. And so he was saving kids in his class. Now, during the break time, this got out into the principal's office and they called him. They called him in, and the principal says, Luciano, why did we hire for what purpose? He says, teach French and phys ed. Go back, teach French and phys ed. This cannot continue like this. Okay, 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 okay. So, 
kids go home and say, I received Jesus in my heart today in the class. No? And parents are all upset, you know, so they call for a teacher's meeting. And so, you know, the principal, you know, and, uh, and the, the, the school board and all together call in Luciano. He needs to answer what he's doing. Oh, he says, you know what? Uh, this is a good opportunity for me to tell you what happened in my life. And so he's sharing Jesus with the whole board, you know. And now the principal realizes, wait a minute, you know, he says, we didn't call you here to preach to these people. We want you to answer these people, the grievances they have against you. Yes, it's there, but look at this. No, God wants to save every one of them and keeps preaching, preaching, preaching. And then they stopped him. You know, some parents came to know Jesus in that evening. Now, the principal says, you know what? We're going to call you before the school board from the city. And one of the people on the school board was a Catholic priest. He said, man, he's not excited. I am going to preach to the Catholic priest. Oh, this is so exciting. And so, you know, they called him into the meeting. And so there was all these distinct gentlemen around the table, you know, and he started sharing the gospel. He was almost speaking one hour and didn't stop him. And then, you know, the priest was having enough. And he just got up and he says, Luciano, you are fired. And he says, praise the Lord, hallelujah, no problem. So next day he calls me. He says, pastor, guess what happened? I said, what happened? Last night I was in the front of the school board, you know, and I was uh, preaching to them and I got fired. I said, oh, I'm sorry, you know, like, no, 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 no. He says, don't be sorry because now that I'm fired, I'm going to apply to the next school and then I'm going to do the same thing. Preach to the kids, you know, <laughs> preach to the teachers. And so, and so I'm going to go from one place to another. You see, when you're on fire, you cannot stop. Something burns in your soul. You know, there's people to be saved. There's people to be touched by God. You know? And when you have the fire of the Holy Spirit in your life, that just burns in your soul. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this morning, that fire is available for you. And if you want to have a fire like this, if you want to get excited, enthusiastic for Jesus, you say, man, you know what? I am a good Christian. I am a very solid believer, but I don't have that kind of a fire. This is your invitation to come. For the next five minutes, we are going to pray that God is going to baptize you in the fire of the Holy Spirit, that your soul is going to burn, that you're going to have a new refreshment in your life. Now, something that you have never experienced before, you know, that's going to be this passion that is going to drive you into the cities at the workplace you know in whatever place you go it's gonna drive you in there and you're gonna see how God is going to touch lives because of the fire that burns in your soul hallelujah and so you know if that's you let's stand together let's stand together if that's you I want you to come we are not going to wait for long. We are not going to prolong that service. You know, I know it's a Father's Day, but I know one thing. God has purpose for people to be full of the Holy Spirit and the fire. So if that's you, just come please. And we're going to pray with you and help you know, to receive that kind of a anointing power of God in your life. Because I truly believe that this morning, you know, this is a special night for many of you. Lives are going to be changed and you're going to change lives as a result of receiving that kind of a fire of the Holy Spirit in your life. Don't neglect the fire of the Spirit, you know, because it is the only passion that God can put into your life in order to receive what is needed to be a blessing to other people. And I don't know how you do it here. I forgot to ask now the pastors. So, you know, what we're just going to do, we're just going to raise the hands and we're going to begin to pray. We're going to begin to pray and say, Lord, baptize me with the fire of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to open your mouth. Don't don't whisper to God, all right? Just open your mouth and just begin to pray out loud, out loud, and say, Lord, I need that fire today. I don't want to go home without the fire of the Holy Spirit. I just want to be full of that fire. Lord, baptize me, baptize me, baptize me, baptize me. I desire, oh God, that the fire of the Holy Spirit would burn in my soul. This Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's right. Just open and pray, 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 pray. Pray out loud. That's right. Just tell him. Just tell him. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Fill us. Set us on fire, oh God. 
set us on fire, oh God, that we may burn for you, that people may get to know Jesus, hallelujah, and that all I will be changed as a result of that. That's right. Just lift your hands, lift your hands all over, and just receive it. Receive it, receive it, receive it, receive it, receive it, receive it right now. Yes, let the fire burn in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Receive that anointed power. Receive that fire of all this here. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Oh, shakarabaka Oh, Spirit of God, Spirit of God, touch your lives, touch your lives, touch your lives, touch your lives, touch your lives today, oh God, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah.